Afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. I think we're going to make a start now. Um, my name is Eleanor, um, and I'd like to welcome you to the first big questions um, of the year. Thank you so much for coming along. It's great to have you here. Um, if this is your first time, Big Questions is basically um, a forum where we want to investigate and discuss really important and relevant topics about life um, and Christianity and about faith. Um, and today we've got Dr. Andrew Satch with us and he's going to be helping us think through the question, can a rational Cambridge student um, believe in God? So this will take the form of a short talk um, and then there'll be a little bit of time for discussion around tables um, and then there'll be a question and answer time afterwards. Andrew studied here in Cambridge, he did Natsuki at John's um, and then he did a PhD in auditory neuroscience um, and now works um, in London at a church um, giving talks at these sorts of events regularly. Um, so do text in your questions for the question time during the talk, the number that you'll need you'll see on the pillars around the room um, or feel free to ask questions from the floor when question time comes along too after the talk's finished. So without further ado, Andrew Satch. Thanks very much. It's good to be back in Cambridge. Thanks for giving up your lunch hour to hear me address this question. Can a rational Cambridge student believe in God? And the answer is going to be yes, I think you can. And uh, even more than that, I think there are rational reasons for doing so. Um, I came up to Cambridge um, over 20 years ago now, quite a long time ago, um, and I was an atheist or I was a skeptic. I didn't really believe in God. And I was um, pretty skeptical about Christians. I thought that Christians uh, were gullible because I'd never heard anyone give me a serious reason to believe anything about Jesus. And I thought Christians were hypocrites because I knew about the Catholic priest paedophile scandals in the papers and even the stuff that went on in our local church. So I was pretty much not interested. I wanted to know what the world was about. I didn't think that Christianity was a very sensible place to look. And then over my first term and a half at Cambridge, my thoughts changed radically. I basically met some Christians who didn't fit my stereotype. They weren't gullible. Some of them much more intelligent than me, much more thought through on questions of philosophy and the, the world and evidence than I was. And nor were they hypocrites. Here were people, the first time I think I've met people who actually took Jesus seriously and tried to live in the way that he taught. It was very attractive and it made me start thinking and looking into it. And I, I started coming across lots of reasons why it made sense to believe in Jesus. I'll give you just a few of them very briefly, but then I want to spend most of my time saying something slightly different. So um, briefly, I started discovering reasons such as uh, Christianity made rational sense of the world in a way that I began to understand my atheistic assumptions didn't do. More about that in a little bit. It made sense philosophically. Um, secondly, I started to realise that... Um, Christianity changed people for the better, at least those I saw up close, and the kind of character that they showed was very, very attractive. Some of the ways that I sort of instinctively wanted to live, and here are Christians living like that, in a way that I discovered that I was unable to. That made sense. But um, maybe ultimately, fundamentally, I'd never realised before that Christianity ultimately is a question of history, and therefore objective. So I always thought that Christianity was either an aesthetic, you know, so are you into organ music and stained glass windows? And the answer was not particularly. No, it's not, not really my thing, but if it's your thing, then that's fine, and you want to go to a cathedral sometimes and, and get the sort of ambience and the vibe, great. Not really for, it, for me. I thought it was an aesthetic. Or I thought it was an ethic. Here is a, a series of principles of how to live, that some people find useful, and I mainly found them useful, except where I disagreed. But then I realised, and this is very obvious, but I, it was, I was slow to get it, that Christianity actually is about history. It's about a claim that 2,000 years ago, a man was walking the streets of Israel who was also the creator of the universe. Now, that is a crazy claim, but it's a historical claim. So in a real towns like Cambridge, with real people in like us, one of the people brushing shoulders with others in the streets was also the creator of the universe. And the claim was that 2,000 years ago, this person, this um, Nazarene carpenter, 
um, did various extraordinary miracles to persuade people that he must be the God who made the world. So he did things like uh, walking on water at room temperature. Obviously, you can do that if you go to somewhere like the Baltic Sea in the winter, but he did it in the middle of the, the Middle East. Um, he did things like um, cure people of leprosy by touching them, or even on several occasions raising people from the dead. And finally, it's claimed he himself died and rose again. Now, obviously, you'll be skeptical about some of those things. You might not have looked at them. But I hadn't even realized that they were historical questions. It's obvious, isn't it? Either this stuff happened 2,000 years ago, or it didn't. If it didn't happen 2,000 years ago, then Christianity is a lie, and Christians are especially gullible, which maybe is what you thought already. If it did happen 2,000 years ago, then Christianity must be true, and all of us who aren't following Jesus are badly mistaken. But it's a true or false thing. It's not just a matter of opinion, like, do you like organ music? Or are you into Jesus' ethics? It's a bit like, you know, the Battle of Hastings, 1066. That's about the only date I learned in school history. I was a science student. But, you know, if I were to say, oh, no, um, for me, the Battle of Hastings was in 966, then I would fail my history paper. Because it, it wasn't. Or if I say, oh, yeah, for, for me, it was the, the Chinese who landed in Kent in 1066. Well, it, it wasn't. It was the Normans. Um, things that happened in history are true or false for everybody, irrespective of what my opinion might be about it. And so the, the key rational questions for me became, what actually happened 2,000 years ago? Who was this person, Jesus Christ? Did he do the things that were claimed that people witnessed him doing? Now, I used to think miracles were impossible. I think that was slightly um, philosophically circular, actually. My, my reasoning went like this. Because there is no God, and the universe is purely matter and chance, therefore anything that violates the principles we know that govern matter of chance can't be true, therefore miracles can't be true. It was circular thinking, because I'd smuggled in as the premise that this is an atheistic mechanical universe. If I change the premise slightly and say, here is a universe created by an intelligent God who ordinarily sustains the universe in a regular kind of way so that miracles don't happen. But very, very occasionally, when he wants to get everyone's attention, messes with things by walking on water and raising some from the dead, that's actually also entirely consistent. And the question is, between them, what actually happened 2,000 years ago? Are you even open to the possibility, I wonder, that there is a God who made the world? Are you open to the possibility that such a God could have done miracles if he'd wanted to? And what better way to get people's attention? In fact, I now realise I'd actually be slightly suspicious if someone turned up claiming to be God and then couldn't do any miracles. I think that would be more problematic, wouldn't it? Oh, hi, you're lucky to have me today in Cambridge. Actually, I'm your creator. And you'd say in one of the questions in a moment, please prove it. I'm sorry I can't prove it, but take my word for it. I made everything. You'd be more sceptical about that. Someone who claimed to be God, who really was God, I would expect to do miracles. But the question, of course, is did he? What actually happened? And I would love for you, right at the beginning of maybe if you're Cambridge career, if you're in the first year, or sometime into it, this term, I'd love to persuade you to look at it rationally. And looking at Christianity rationally means looking at the first century eyewitness documents because you need to decide what actually happened. If Jesus was a con man who fooled lots of people, then uh, you, you could ignore it, or you, even more compassionately, you could try and rescue your Christian friends from this delusion. But if Jesus was the creator of the universe, and he proved it, then you need to respond to him. Can a rational Cambridge student believe in God? Yes, they can. Uh, there's evidence. Uh, it makes philosophical sense. It changes people's lives. Please look at it. That, that's what I think what you expect me to say. I wanted to say it briefly. But what I actually want to say is slightly different from that. And uh, actually, this last Sunday, my, my normal day job is to be a, a Christian preacher and a minister in a couple of churches in London. And this last Sunday, I was teaching on a passage from the Bible that I realized spoke exactly to this question. But it doesn't have the answer that you're expecting. And in fact, the answer it gives is probably going to annoy you 
and might even make you very angry. So that's a risk I'm taking, but it's the Bible's answer, and it's very surprising. Let me just read you one paragraph from the book of Romans in the New Testament. God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they're without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's a surprising answer. So this passage is saying, just to paraphrase it, God is really angry at the way that in the world right now, people are hiding the truth about him. They're suppressing the truth. Now, of course, the idea of suppressing the truth presupposes that we had access to truth. So in order to suppress something, you, you've got to have it first, and then you've got to hide it. And that's exactly what the paragraph says that we've done. We had access to truth about God, and then we hid it. Where do we get knowledge about God? Well, the passage says it's obvious to all of us because of what's been made ever since the creation of the world. So we are without excuse. So there's something about creation itself, something about the world you live in, that tells everyone here very, very clearly, that there is a God. Let me just explore that um, couple, in a couple of different ways. Actually, firstly, the fact that there is a universe at all, rather than being no universe, implies that there is a God. Um, and I want to explain to you now something that philosophers called the Kalam cosmological argument. I love the name of it, because Kalam sounds like sort of kapow, or kaching or something you'd find in a comic book. But it's called the, the Kalam cosmological argument. Very simply, it goes like this. Premise one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion from the premises, the universe had a cause. Everything that began to exist had a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. Or to put it another way very simply, something had to make the Big Bang go bang. Now, this is a real problem, actually, for the atheists, because people used to think that the universe was eternal. And you don't actually have to explain things that are eternal. You don't have to explain things that don't change. Imagine um, you were to say, you know, how come that, that leather briefcase is still there on the stage now when it was there at the beginning of the talk? It doesn't need to be explained, does it? Because it, it's there, because it was there. Nothing's changed. But... If I were to throw it on the floor like that, and you said, how come the leather briefcase is now sprawled on the floor when it was over there? And someone said, oh, I don't know. I think it, it just, sort of, just sort of happened by magic. That's not a very good explanation. Something's changed when we look for a cause. Now, when people used to think the universe was eternal, you didn't really need to explain it. Why is the universe here? Well, the universe is here because it was here. It doesn't need to explain something that doesn't change. But now scientists all agree that the universe had a beginning in time. You've got the question, what made the universe begin in time? Uh, what caused a big bang to go bang? And actually the Christian has already answered. There was a God who decided to start a universe. Someone says, ah, but who created God? Now, no one created God. God's eternal. You don't have to explain things that don't change. Why is God here? Well, God's here because he was here. He's always been here. But why is the universe began to be here? He made it. Entirely consistent, but atheism really has problems with that. But not only did the Big Bang go bang, but you could point to the fact that the, the physicists tell us that the Big Bang went bang at exactly the right speed. Now, it um, turns out that if the universe had exploded too quickly in the inflationary phase... I don't really know very much about what this means, but if you're a physicist, you can explain it to us afterwards. But if the universe expands too quickly in the inflationary phase, then all you would get would be hydrogen atoms with billions of miles of space in between every one. You'd have no stars, no other kind of elements, and certainly no human beings in the universe, just gas. On the other hand, if the universe expanded too slowly, then gravity would quickly get overcome it, and it would collapse back on, in on itself, and you get a, a big bang and then a big crunch, a universe and then nothing 
even before you got one millisecond on your stopwatch. To get any kind of universe of the kind that we live in, that um, lasts for longer than a millisecond and has stuff other than hydrogen in it, the balance between the expansion and contraction forces has got to be accurate to within one part in 10 to the 55. One in 10 with 55 zeros. If that doesn't mean much to you, then take a continent the size of America, cover it with five penny pieces, stack them to a depth of the distance between here and the moon, 380,000 kilometers away, paint one of them, uh, do the same for a billion, 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 billion other continents the same size, paint one of them red with nail varnish, blindfold your boyfriend, get him to pick one at random. That's about one in 10 to the 55 of getting the numbers right. This isn't, by the way, this isn't research done by a special secret Christian laboratory. This is mainstream physics numbers. It just looks very, very, very unlikely. Although, it makes perfect sense if there is a God, he got the numbers right. Actually, you could multiply examples. You could say, how come it seems to me that personality is real and that good and evil are real categories and they matter? When actually, the atheist says, no, these are just random numbers and, and, and labels that you give to randomness billions of years later. I have a sense that no personality is not reducible to the impersonal and that morality is not arbitrary and just the cause of numbers. It will make sense if there is a God who made the universe. So I could, I could argue like that and say here are a load of arguments philosophically from creation that ought to convince you. But actually that isn't even what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say it is possible for someone to be persuaded by looking at the arguments that God made the world. It says something more provocative than that, which, as I say, might annoy you. The Bible says you already know that God made the world. Not you could be argued into it, but it is perfectly obvious to you already. But you suppress the truth. You try to hide from the obvious implications of your existence. It's like a beach ball in the swimming pool. And it keeps bob bobbing, bobbling up to the surface, but you do your best to try and sit on it and keep it down. We have access to God, to a knowledge of God, but we hide it. Now, that's controversial because our society absolutely disagrees with that. Our, our narrative of the, the situation is that we're all looking, we're doing our best to find out what the universe is about. And God, if he exists at all, is being at best fickle uh, and, and at worst, where well, he's just playing some sort of hide-and-seek games. Look, God, where are you? We're looking everywhere for you. You haven't made it very clear. I'm a sincere searcher, God, and you're hiding. And the Bible says, no, it's, it's the other way around. God is obvious, he's clear, and we're hiding. Which is why Jesus, you may know, told a famous story about a lost sheep. A man had a whole flock of sheep. And one of them gets lost and he says, doesn't he leave 99 in the open field and go searching after the sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders, I guess that's how you carry sheep, and goes home saying, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And Jesus says, just so, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one rebel against God who turns back and comes home to him. Jesus tells the story of us, of God looking for people and of course we'd have to change that wouldn't we have to update that story we'd have to make it into the, the parable of the lost shepherd here are the sheep going everywhere ma, ma. have you seen the shepherd i don't know where the shepherd is i don't even know if there is a shepherd i looked over here couldn't find a shepherd and here's this little sneaky shepherd in a cave somewhere thinking haha they'll never find me I've, I've disguised myself with a bit of grass or whatever it is now jesus says god's looking and we're hiding Jesus says the rational Cambridge student already knows that there's a God. They know they came from somewhere. They know that where they came from wasn't randomness. No one really honestly believes that. Uh, they sense instinctively that, that their personality stems from an ultimate person. That their morality stems from an ultimate reference point of good and evil. In fact, they know, says the Bible, that there is a God. But in their wickedness, they suppress it. And that is a scandal. Uh, God is upset about that. 
God, God who made us, who gives us everything that we have, life and breath and everything. And yet not only do we fail to acknowledge him, but we, we try to hide away even from the acknowledgement of his existence. And God is very, very offended about that. Now, as I say, it might anger you. You can come back to me in a minute. But I, I do want to say just in, in closing that I can say as a matter of personal testimony that I was guilty of that. As, a, as, I, as I said, at Cambridge, I started to encounter Christians and some of the evidence for Jesus. I started looking at the historical eyewitness documents. I, again, I commend that to you. As I looked at them, I became more and more convinced that it made sense. Uh, real reasons, real evidence, real facts. As I began to examine my own foundations as an atheist, I began more and more convinced that they didn't make sense. Why did the Big Bang go bang? How come the numbers are so accurate? And, and so on and so on. It became obvious that Christianity was much more coherent than where I was currently standing. So you'd think, really, that as a rational Cambridge student, I ought to have become a follower of Jesus in my first term. But I didn't. And the reason I didn't wasn't because of lack of rational evidence. It was because I was hiding. I mean, the, the beach ball was struggling to the surface, and it just made me do, try all the harder to sit on it and press it down. You see, for me, I, I wasn't the objective investigator that I like to kid myself that I was. I was someone on the run from God. And it is obvious, actually, because whenever I talked about Christianity, I would throw any objection at the Christian. It wasn't necessarily objections that I even thought were realistic or plausible. It was just any way of, please leave me alone, because I don't want to believe that, even if it's true. Because I had this idea, crazy idea, that somehow Jesus wanted to wreck my life. I thought that turning to my creator would mean I just became grey and lifeless and dull. I mean, I couldn't sleep with who I wanted to at Cambridge. It meant that my career wouldn't turn out the way I wanted, and I thought that would be worse. And so I went hiding. And the one thing you don't do if you're hiding is come to talk like this. So well done. I used to actually schedule essay crises. These talks used to be on Sunday nights. I used to do my physiology essay at the top floor of the John's Library. And if a Christian came to ask me, I said, no, the deadline is tomorrow, which it always was, because I always left it at the last minute, and began then a lifelong uh, system of doing that. Um, I deliberately avoid it. If you come this far, well done for coming. Thanks for coming this lunchtime. Sorry for being provocative. You know there's a God. But please, will you look at the evidence and convince yourself it's true? But just beware of what might be going on in your own life if you're actually on the run and trying to keep the, the, the beach ball underneath the surface. Um, I think it's 37 past, which is when I was told I should stop speaking. So I'm feeling very virtuous. i hand over. Thank you. So we've just got um, a couple of minutes around tables to discuss what we've heard, just for a little bit of time, and then we'll come back um, for a question time with Andrew. It's very fancy. It turns out you should on that. Ah. Oh. Okay, great. Sorry that wasn't very long. Um, if you could come back together um, and have some time for questions. Do keep um, texting your questions in. Um, there's also going to be a roving mic going around, um, so if you have a question from the floor, do stick up a hand. Does anyone have an initial question, or we can go for one from the text? No? Okay, great. Let's go for one for the text. Um, so, why is, the go why is God the cause of the existence of the universe instead of anyone or anything else? Um, well, that passage I uh, was quoting from, it says that the things that are obvious about God from um, creation are his eternal power and divine nature. Um, so basically, the, the things you can tell about God is that he's powerful, um, he's eternal, he's got to have been there before the universe itself, um, and that he is divine. In other words, he is God. You can tell the godness of God. What does it mean to say you can tell God's divineness? I mean, it almost sounds, I think it just says you can tell he's not like you. He's not, like a create, he's not like a created thing, because he's the one who had to make created things. So a, a very simple definition of God in the Bible is that he's the creator rather than the created, and everything in the universe fits into one of those two categories. It's either him or it's something made by him. And that's, that's what you can tell. Now, that is not enough to, to know everything about God. So you might say, it's obvious as a God. I wonder whether that God is 
um, is friendly or hostile. I wonder if that God is, is morally good or morally mixed or morally bad. So that you'd have this big question that the universe doesn't answer, but it does tell you there is somebody more powerful than you who's eternal and powerful who made, who made everything. Now, I think that, that ought to make us think, you know, how, do I, how can I find out what this God's like? And as a Christian, I think that the next place I'd point you is, as I started with, what about history? Who is this person 2,000 years ago who claimed to be the creator? Because if that's true, we suddenly know a whole load more. We don't just know he is some being. We know he's a being who's like this. And people met him and they discovered what he thought about things and how he behaved with people. And then you start saying, oh yeah, God is not only powerful, but also humble and good and he loves justice and he's willing to stoop and condescend to serve people beneath him. And even he loves us enough to be willing to sacrifice his son's life for our salvation. You start finding out a whole lot more about God. But the thing that all of us at least know is that he's there. Brilliant, thank you. Does anyone um, want to come back on that from the floor or have another question? Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a mic coming around. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of continue that a bit because, I mean, I study physics. Um, and, and just in terms of the kind of cosmological argument that uh, the universe had called, therefore that cause must be God. Well, I suppose the trouble is you can think of a kind of a couple of alternative explanations other than God, such as, well, I mean, one idea would be that the universe is caused by a previous collapsing universe or that the universe was caused by something that since disappeared. So even if there was a God, that doesn't mean there's a God now. And I just wonder, and even you can have something that, you know, some other f unknown physical entity, but there's got no moral relevance to, you know, Christianity or any kind of religious stuff. And I just wonder why Christians don't often seem to um, investigate those kind of possibilities. Sure. Well, let me, let me answer in two different ways. I think, firstly, unless your cause is itself eternal, you just push the question back. So if you had, you know... Um, the universe was caused by the pre-universe cause and then the question comes what caused the pre-universe cause or the pre-pre-universe cause did and whatever but until you get to something eternal you still ask the same question and um, secondly I think you need to have um, something so you need to say I've got to find something eternal um, I've got to find something powerful and then if you think that this that this world has any kind of intelligent order and that personality has any basis I think you then start saying, I think this cause has got to be eternal, powerful, personal, um, moral. And you get closer and closer to a description that traditionally people use the word God to describe. So I think, I think you start to converge on that kind of being. But you don't know everything about God, as, as I've said. Um, as a Christian, the, the thing that convinced me most, and I'd, again, again, I'd commend to all of you, is in addition to what every human being knows, just from being in the world that's been made... We're very fortunate that we have access to eyewitness documents about Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. So you can't buy them in every country in the world. If you're in North Korea, um, they're illegal. If you're in Iran, they'll get confiscated. In England, you can just go to a bookshop and buy it, or you can go on the internet and buy it, or not even buy it, get it for free. Um, we have access to this, the, the eyewitness testimony about this person who claimed to be God. And I, I would say that as you look at him... It's a true false question, isn't it? Was he God, was he not? Was he a con man? Um, was he deluded? Did he actually walk on water? If he did, and he really raised from the dead, I think, you know, even the sceptical physicist goes, yeah, I don't think it's possible for, to, to walk on water at, at room temperature because of the displacement, etc. But this guy's doing it. <laughs> you know, if you see him in the boat, something else is going on. Or the biologist says, I don't think it's possible to walk around after you're dead. You don't have to be that sophisticated biology to know that, by the way. You just have to live life, yeah? No, no one who's, who you bury, you ever meet again. And then here's a guy that they buried him, and then he's walking around again, and everyone thinks something different's happening. So you've got to do check out the eyewitnesses and look at what they say. Well, one thing that convinces me, so I need to be short with these questions, with these answers. One thing that convinces me, people give their lives for causes they believe in. So martyrs always believe in their causes, now, it doesn't mean that the causes are true. So, for example, I don't think it's true that you go to paradise if you fly an aeroplane into the Twin Towers. But I do think that the people who flew the aeroplane into them thought it was true. 
because you're only martyred for a cause you believe in. Now, the, the, for me, the very compelling thing about um, the Christian, early Christian documents is the same people who gave their lives for the cause were the people who knew whether the cause was true. And I don't think you give your life for something that you know isn't true. So, um, anyway, I, I offer you that. I should shut up. More questions? Brilliant. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got that's time for. Time Thank for. you very much. Um, can I say, I'm going to say one more thing, even though we've run out of time. My, what, what I would most love you to do after this, you may not want to because you might think this was an annoying talk and you're not interested, but my, my plea with you, my commendation to you, get one of the eyewitness documents about Jesus. There are some, I think, at the back. What I suggest you do, you can do it differently if you want, is rather than just, it will take you about an hour and a half to read the whole thing. Don't do that. Read it slowly enough to actually think about it. And my suggestion is read chapter one. Tick everything you agree with, cross everything you disagree with, and underline anything you don't understand. So just annotate it. So spend an hour on one chapter. Meet a Christian for a coffee, which they'll pay for. I'm, I'm promising on, on their behalf. <laughs> and discuss your annotations. And if it's useful, then do the same for chapter two. If it's not useful, then leave it there. So all it costs you uh, minimum is an hour of your time and one coffee, um, but it could cost the Christian maximum 21 coffees or 42 coffees if they have a coffee with you. Um, and just try that because it would be excellent, wouldn't it, to, to engage as a rational Cambridge student firsthand with the eyewitness evidence. Love you to do that. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm really sorry we didn't get to answer all of your questions. There were lots of good ones, and so please do feel free to stick around and chat about them afterwards. Um, and Andrew will be around after the talk too. Um, he'll be more than happy to chat to you more. Um, if you could pick up the feedback forms on your table as well, we absolutely love to hear what you think about these things, and it would be really helpful um, for us if you could fill them in. If you do want to carry on thinking about this more, this topic, um, there are a number of ways that you can do that. First of all is something that Andrew mentioned. Um, we've got some books at the back that are free for you to take away um, if you're a guest of the CU today. Um, this includes this, which is um, John's Gospel, John's account of Jesus' life. This is one of the primary eyewitness documents um, that Andrew was talking about. And there are some other books, too, to help you with that. Um, also, if you want to meet up with a, for a coffee with a Christian, if you just check the little I'm interested bit on the feedback form, leave your name and your CRS ID, um, and someone will get in contact with you and will buy you a coffee. Um, we also have um, the CU is putting on another event tomorrow evening. Um, at Eden Baptist Church, there are some flyers at the back. There's a free dinner from 6.30 and then a talk afterwards, um, which is thinking a bit about if God does exist, um, what does that then mean? Um, what does that mean for us? Um, so now feel free um, to stick around or rush off to lectures if you like, um, and there'll be some refreshments coming around to your tables. Thanks very much for coming.